Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I was reading a thesis by a young history major, which discusses how officers wore uniforms that they managed to change up a little bit because of the culture, the peacetime culture, the civilian clothing that they wore, and how the United States wasn't exactly military oriented. We had a small army. It's a well-established fact. Reading the, the thesis led me to a quote from a book that I was unfamiliar with. It was written in 1909 by a British military historian by the name of George Henderson. Henderson's book is focused on Stonewall Jackson. It's a two-volume series called Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. It definitely has a Southern view on Jackson and on the Confederate army that he led. It's a quite an interesting volume. I read bits and pieces of it. This particular quote that was in the thesis stood out with me because it strikes a it gives you a sense of what the United States was like during the antebellum times and how unfamiliar Americans on both sides were with the idea of a standing army. Some of this is probably known to students of the Civil War. You'll find some of this familiar. But for those who are maybe not as familiar with the Civil War and those of us who are accustomed to Today's military, which is well-established and well-supplied and has a strong in infrastructure, you may find this a little bit foreign, a little bit unusual. So to set this up for you, Henderson is talking about the Confederate Army and how they are unprepared for war, just as unprepared as you'll find as the North is. So let me take you into Henderson's comments about the Virginia Army. He says, an assemblage so motley could hardly be called an army. And the daring of the government who, with this levy and mass, which is his Latin term for conscription, as their only bulwark against invasion, had defied a great power, seems at first strongly allied to folly. But there was little cause for apprehension. The federal authorities were as yet powerless to enforce the policy of invasion on which the president, President Lincoln, had resolved. The great bulk of the northern troops were just as far from being soldiers as the Virginians, and the regular army was too small to be feared. I'll pause there for a second, because this is the part that feels familiar. I know you've heard the stories of how those early months of the war, most Americans in the North and the South believed it would be of a short duration. But of course, that was not to be. There was a lot of work to be done to make the armies battle ready, campaign ready, to have the infrastructure to support them. And a lot of that is because the culture of America it's not, not accustomed to having a military. So here's the second passage I want to read from Henderson's book. Here we go. Quote, the people of the United States had long cherished the utopian dream that war was impossible upon their favored soil. The militia was considered an archeological absurdity. The regular troops, admirable as was their work upon the frontier, were far from being a source of national pride. The uniform was held to be a badge of servitude. The drunken loafer, bartering his vote for a dollar or a dram, looked down with the contempt of a sovereign citizen upon men who submitted to the indignity of discipline. And in denouncing the expense of a standing army, unscrupulous politicians found a sure path to popular favor. So, when secession became something more than a mere threat, the armed forces of the Commonwealth, this is Virginia, had been reduced almost to extinction. And when the flag was fired upon, the nation found itself powerless to resent the insult. 
The military establishment mustered no more than 16,000 officers and men. There was no reserve, no transports, no organization for war, and the troops were scattered in distant garrisons. The Navy consisted of six screw frigates, only one of which was in commission, of five steam sloops, some 20 sailing ships, and a few gunboats. The majority of the vessels, although well-armed, were out of date. 9,000 officers and men were the extent of their personnel and several useful craft, together with more than 1,200 guns, were laid up in Norfolk Dockyard on the coast of Virginia within 100 miles of Richmond. So there Henderson lays out the situation. There's no way this was going to be a short war because there wasn't an organization, there was no military organization, or I should say a very, very small military organization, a small standing army in the north. And of course, there was none in the south. Most of the resources had been drained. Now, Henderson goes on to talk a little bit about how important building that infrastructure is. And I want to read this to you, too, because I think it's interesting. It gives you a sense of how incrementally an army would need to be built, whether you're an army of invasion or an army of defense. So here's where Henderson comes in talking about the Confederacy. He says, quote, the cause of the Confederacy although her white population of 7 million souls was smaller by two thirds than that of the North, was far from hopeless. So he's being optimistic here. The North undoubtedly possessed immense resources, but an efficient army, even when the supply of men and arms be unlimited, cannot be created in a few weeks or even a few months, least of all an army of invasion. Undisciplined troops, if the enemy be ill-handled, may possibly stand their ground on the defensive, as did Jackson's riflemen at New Orleans. He's talking about the other Jackson, Andrew Jackson, or the colonials at Bunker Hill. But fighting behind earthworks is a very different matter to making long marches and executing complicated maneuvers under heavy fire. Without a trained staff and an efficient administration, an army is incapable of movement. Even with a well-organized commissariat, it is a most difficult business to keep a marching column supplied with food and forage. And the problem of transport, unless a railway or a river be available, taxes the ability of the most experienced leader. A march of 80 or 100 miles into an enemy's country sounds a simple feat, but unless every detail has been most carefully thought out, it will not improbably be more disastrous than a lost battle. A march of two or 300 miles is a great military operation. A march of 600, an enterprise of which there are few examples. I'll stop there because Henderson continues on to discuss the finer points of military organization and support and infrastructure and moving into long marches supported by having the food and et cetera, and et cetera. So you get the idea. I think it's really interesting that Henderson gets to this level of detail and it gives me some background and some context as I think about what historians like Henderson were thinking about in the early 20th century and how later on the later 20th century and today, when we hear about the North had superior resources, neither side was prepared for war. The United States had a small peacetime army and militias of that time period were largely ceremonial fraternal organizations. This is part of where this comes from. Henderson is getting at that in the comments here in his book. So that's it for today. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Take care.